This is the Lions Unchained podcast, where the shackles of your mind are broken. It's not for the faint-hearted, but the chosen few who've embraced the call to leadership, dare to venture where others will not, and believe in God's supernatural power. Join Carl Joseph now for a life-changing word. Get ready to be unleashed into your destiny. This is going to seem like a strange point to make, but there are Christians out there who are working against themselves, and the Bible actually speaks of this. There's a fascinating scripture to be found in the second book of Timothy, which reveals something every believer ought to get a hold of. Now, for some people, they are flat out angry and mad at God because there are some things in their lives that haven't gone according to their own plans or expectations, and they're blaming God for it. The cold hard truth is that despite what we may feel about these issues, God is in fact innocent. He is not to blame for what might appear to be unfair to you. What we often try to pin on him is in fact a work of the enemy that's trying to cause us to doubt God's goodness in your life. Let's read this passage from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, did you notice that last verse I read to you? It says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Friend, whenever we think, speak, or act against God's word, we are opposing ourselves and ultimately God himself. It's Satan who takes men captive, and the number one way he does this is through deception. Deception and ignorance are Satan's dynamic duo of destruction. If you don't know God's word, then you'll be ignorant of his ways. And if you think God is the one out to get you, then you are deceived. Knowledge of God's word is very important, as I have stressed in other broadcasts. But notice also in verse 25, it takes meekness or humility to come to the realization that perhaps we are a part of the problem, and this can be hard for some of us to accept. The trouble is we have many preconceived notions and ideas of who God is and what he'll do without even consulting his word to find out what his ways are. If Satan can get you to start blaming God for all your troubles, then friend, you're in a very difficult place because you're denying assistance from the very one who's able to set you free from your predicament. It's interesting that some religious institutions often try to make out that we can be more pious or holy by embracing poverty, suffering, or even sickness. But we know from God's word that these came into the earth because of sin and are a part of the curse. Accidents, disease, sickness, death, and disasters come as a result of the fall of man and the cursed earth and Satan and his cohorts. Adam knew no sickness before he knew sin. Dr. John Alexander Dowie, who helped reintroduce divine healing to the church in the last century, said it this way, Disease is the foul offspring of its father, Satan, and its mother, sin. The Bible pictures Jesus as the deliverer of men and women, not as their destroyer. Satan is the destroyer. Jesus is the deliverer, and Jesus said himself, For the Son of Man came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Luke 9.56 Friend, the topic of sickness is so vast, I don't have time to cover it all here, but suffice to say, sickness was a curse outlined in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 22, verse 27 through 29, verse 35, and verses 58 through 61. And this has not changed. It is a curse in the earth. We need to fight sickness. We need to put some resistance to it. It would be foolish, then, to attempt to express false piety by embracing something that Christ annulled when he died on the cross. There is no poverty, sickness, or disease in heaven. And after all, Christ said in his Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is therefore God's desire through prayer to enforce his will upon the earth through his people, just as it is in heaven. However, if we're trying to enforce his will through a sin-infested and cursed earth with the devil and demon forces, they are working against us. This is the source of opposition in our lives, not God. If God was in cahoots with the devil, then Jesus wouldn't have gone round healing all who were oppressed of the devil while he was on earth. No, my friend, it's a satanic lie of religion that suggests that good and evil come from God or that God is on the side of evil and uses poverty, sickness, or disease and death for his purposes and glory. 
One of the scriptures that people use to prove this, that both good and evil come from God, is Isaiah 45, verse 7. And it says this, and I quote, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things, unquote. Now, one of the things I've learned down the years is it's so important we read a scripture in its proper context. So let's go up a few verses here and find out exactly what God is talking about in the full context of this passage. I'm reading from Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 7. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, that thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Did you catch that, my friend, in verse 6? God is talking about the rising of the sun. We all know that when the sun rises from our standpoint, it does so because of the Earth's rotation. So as the Earth perpetually rotates once every 24 hours around the sun, consequently, there will be half of the globe in darkness and half of the Earth in light. Therefore, when God talks about darkness here in this context, he's not talking about spiritual darkness, merely the darkness that falls on one side of the Earth as it rotates in its daily cycle. Notice that it says, the rising of the sun and from the west. We all know that the sun rises from the east and heads west from our vantage point here on earth. But if we view the earth from the north star, which is God's viewpoint, because heaven in scripture is always mentioned as being located in the north, then the earth turns counterclockwise and it rotates from the west toward the east, just as the scripture states. So in this passage, God is looking down upon the earth from above, from his heavenly perspective in this chapter of Isaiah. We also know from the book of James that God is the father of lights, and we know that in him there is no darkness at all. So this is not referring to spiritual darkness. God would have to put himself out in order to create darkness, because darkness is the absence of light. He cannot by nature do this. Now what about the next verse, I make peace and create evil? When it comes to the King James translation of 1611, the Hebrew language is dynamic. It's richer in content than English, and quite often the verb tenses were not translated as they should have been by the scribes of the time. If you read the introduction and preface in some of the older versions of the Young's literal translation, or better still, Robert E. Young's book entitled Hints to Bible Interpretation, this will be better understood, and God's loving nature will not be marred by the occasional inappropriate usage of the ten structures in the King James Version. The author, Robert E. Young, was an instrumental figure in revealing deeper truths from God's Word, particularly regarding the tense structure when translating the Hebrew and Greek into English. Although I consider the King James Version to be the paragon of all translations, Robert Young explains something that's often hidden from the common reader. Friend, I want you to get a hold of this, and I'm quoting Young now. The original Hebrew of many scriptures was written in the permissive tense, but because the English language has no corresponding permissive tense, the verbs were instead wrongly translated in the causative tense. In other words, the scribes wrote something like this, The Lord put sickness on them, but it should have been translated, The Lord allowed sickness to be put on them. And the reason he allowed it is because of their own choice. Under the Mosaic law, when God's people broke commandments, they were no longer under his divine protection. All he could do was permit the devil to bring those afflictions upon them. Remember, sickness is one of the consequences of breaking the law. It was a curse and a consequence of disobedience. It was a result of their choice. Going back to the verse in question in Isaiah 45, verse 7, it should read, God allows evil but he isn't creating it. Their sin and wrongdoing brought these dreadful plagues upon them. A cursory reading of Deuteronomy 28 identifies several blessings for obedience and curses or calamities for disobedience. A benevolent God warns his people in advance how to avoid calamity, and this is outlined in this very chapter. Let me give you an analogy right now of what I'm talking about. Let's say that there's a tornado coming to a small town. 
Now Frank, the local storm warden, goes around town and shouts from the rooftops, There's a severe tornado coming. If you remain outside in the streets, you will surely be destroyed. I implore you to come to the tornado shelter that I've constructed for the entire town. Don't worry, it's big enough for everyone. I have flashlights, food, water, etc. to ride this thing out. So please come immediately and you will be safe. However, if you remain outside, you will likely die, if not be severely injured. Let me ask you this, friend. If some people heard Frank's warning of danger and chose not to hide in his shelter and they died as a result, is it Frank's fault or theirs? Did Frank kill or smite the people who tragically died or was it a consequence of their personal choice? Frank allowed the people to choose their own fate, but he provided a means of escape and shelter to avoid the calamity. Frank allowed their deaths, but it certainly wasn't his will for them to die. He wasn't the cause. He certainly didn't approve of their actions. The people who died ignored Frank's warnings to their peril, and it's the same with God. Herein lies the analogy of a God who warns his people, provides protection, and issues the consequences for disobedience, yet leaves the decision to his people. God is not the one sending the storms of life, my friend. Satan is the God of this world, and the entire world lies in wickedness as a result of its fallen state. God certainly does not approve of everything that he allows, as I have said several times. Many banks are robbed every month in the United States, but you wouldn't accuse the President of the United States of doing it or even allowing it. You wouldn't say something like, it happened under his administration, so we're going to blame it all on him. That's the same as blaming God for everything that happens to us. This is a cop-out. This is religious thinking. This is erroneous thinking, my friend. You have to sharply cut your prejudice of what is God and what is the devil. Because if there's an inkling of doubt that somehow God is using something evil against you for his purposes and plans, then you're not going to resist it. The Bible says, submit to God and resist the devil. The trouble is, people have got it the wrong way around. They're submitting to the devil and resisting God. Friend, you need to crack open the dusty pages of your old King James and start to read the Bible for yourself. John chapter 10 is another great example of the delineation between good and evil. It is the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that he might give us abundant life, the zoe life. That's what that means in the Greek, zoe. That means full of peace, shalom. It means prosperity. It means healing to the physical flesh. It means protection. He's come to give you abundant life. Let's not get the two mixed up. Friend, let me end right now with this verse, Acts 10:38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung on a tree. Friend, cursed is he that hangs on a tree. Jesus became a curse for us. Therefore, we are no longer prone to the curses in the earth. Sickness, disease, spiritual death, and poverty. These are curses which we are no longer subject to if we appropriate them for ourselves. Friend, Jesus is the good shepherd. He's not a part of the problem. He gave his life for the sheep. In John 10, 32, Jesus said, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which one of these works do you stone me? There are God-haters out there, and they are just wounded people. And it's very sad because God wants to rescue them of their oppression and their hurts. He's the one reaching out today. He's not the oppressor. Friend, I just hope you can get a hold of this. Remember that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and set at liberty them that are bruised. That is the majestic God, the loving and caring God that we serve, my friend. Let's make this very clear. You've been listening to Carl Joseph and the Lions Unchained podcast. Carl is a minister who has witnessed God's miraculous power to save, heal, and deliver. Carl covers topics such as geopolitics, current affairs, cults, societal trends, and end-time events, all through a biblical lens. Every Monday, new podcasts are uploaded, so stay tuned for the next opportunity to roar into victory. Check out carljosephministries.com for exciting articles, teachings, and discussion points. See you next week, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button.